Without the delay, I think I will start my uh, part of the presentation. Oh, let me pull up the share screen. Okay. Do you, do you see my screen? You do see my screen, do you? Yes, we see. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, welcome everyone and welcome all, all the doctors from uh, Zago. And uh, it's my great pleasure, okay, to start this webinar by uh, uh, giving you an overview of the application of high intensity focus ultrasound ablation in gynecology, okay. And uh, so I think uh, I'll leave Dr. Muzaza to introduce me later. So I go directly into my uh, talk, okay. And uh, so for those of you who is the first time to hear about this technology called high intensity focus ultrasound, actually uh, back in 2017, focus uh, uh, the uh, ultra foundation in uh, United States in their uh, state of field report has already defined this as a game changing, transformative and leap forward, okay. And in, in the uh, subsequent uh, and, uh, state of field report, they show that more than 100 indications are currently and, uh, and the different stage of a clinical evaluation. So therefore, I'm mean, hopefully uh, with uh, my introduction and also with the two experts who is going to talk about their experience of uh, using this technology in their respective medical institutions and to give you a sense uh, to, uh, to give you the, the message that we are entering actually the era of medicine of non-invasive uh, 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 medicine. Okay, so uh, first I would like to use this uh, slides to briefly summarize what the principles of, uh, of uh, high food ablation. So high food tumor therapeutic system, okay, converts electric energy into acoustic energy through a transducer, okay? And then the ultrasound emitted by the transducer is focused onto target tissue to confer treatment, okay? The, uh, the temperature at the biological focal points will arise over 65 degree, which will induce instantaneous and irreversible coagulative necrosis. And this is uh, uh, the fundamental uh, 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 principle of how HIFU can uh, eradicate a tumor, ablate a tumor, okay? So the HIFU affords one, uh, one time precise resection while the uh, conformal ablation. If for those of you who watched the couple of videos I we just played before the webinar, you already got a sense of that, okay? And the, the whole procedure can be performed under the real-time monitoring by either ultrasound or the MRI, okay? And this is the video. Uh, I think it's been played twice, okay, to explain how hyper procedure is done, how it's different from the traditional uh, uh, procedure, uh, the surgery. So I think to save the time, I'll skip this, okay? And uh, so what is the strength of this technology? I think uh, uh, Dr. Raymond Satin from South Africa will tell you more about it, okay? So first it will reduce the burden on healthcare system, okay? And second is that actually it will bring many benefits to the, to the patients, okay? So I leave uh, Dr. Raymond to uh, talk to you, uh, in, in, you know, in his part of the talk. And uh, so I will use the next few slides to give you a sum up of why we think this is the mature technology in ob for the treatment of fibroids, which is a common, um, uh, is a, is a, a common indication that occurs at a very high incidence in African country, uh, African women, okay. And uh, to let you know that uh, it's why we think it's the time actually to work with Zago to set up the uh, uh, to bring the service uh, to Zambia, okay? So uh, first, you know, through vigorous clinical studies, okay, we have already established a, a favorable safety profile, okay? And to sum it up, high food is a safe, 
uh, uh, procedure, okay? And it has less complications compared with uh, uh, conventional surgery, surgery, such as uh, hysterectomy, okay, or mimectomy for the treatment of fibroids, okay? And the, as importantly, because it's non-invasive, so it offers rapid recovery for the patient. So what I summarize here uh, is using two clinical studies. One is a retrospective study on the left, which involves 10 centers and uh, has 27,000 cases analyzed, okay? And uh, the conclusion from this uh, study shows that the class C uh, complication rate uh, is uh, uh, as low as 0.3%, okay? And the class D uh, rate is as low as 0.05%. Uh, class C and class D complications are considered major complications, okay? And on the right is the uh, study, actually 20 center perspective uh, ideal trial. The trial is designed uh, study design is done by the Oxford team and the 20 Chinese centers participated and with the involved uh, enrollment of 2,411 patients. And in this uh, uh, perspective study, uh, it, uh, three uh, surgical uh, 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 methods were compared side by side with which is the hysterectomy, myelectomy and high food, okay. And, uh, uh, what I show you here is the class C and D uh, complication rate is in this perspective trial is also uh, uh, for HIFO is as low as 2.2%, which uh, uh, correlates very well with the 27,000 case retrospective study. Okay, and in the same study, the class C and D complication rate for myomectomy and for hysterectomy is around 10%, okay, which is also consistent what's being reported for this two form of surgery. Okay. And also, uh, when we when the doctors uh, uh, to uh, for uh, to to consider whether this is already a technology, I need to learn. I need to pay attention. It's whether it enters the has developed in uh, being uh, entered guidelines in the uh, globally. Okay. So here, uh, as I uh, summarize it here. Uh, the high food for the treatment of uterine fibroids has already entered the UK uh, uh, NICE, I received the NICE recommendation in 2019. I think David will talk a bit more about it in his talk. And uh, it received the US uh, uh, ACOG uh, guideline, entered the ACOG guideline as early as 2008 for MI guided HI, uh, uh, high food, okay. And in China, COGA, it enters the COGA guideline in 2017. And uh, in Canada, it all enters the SOGC guideline in 2015. And in the South Korea, KSOG guideline in 2016. Okay. And also, uh, you know, for the uh, uh, dissemination of this technology, um, we, uh, you will also ask whether an international training program has been developed. The answer is yes, okay. And uh, in the past two years, we have bring the uh, training program that has been developed in China to the international pl platform and the ISMIF, which is the International Society of Minimal Invasive and Virtual Surgery, which Professor David Cranston is the current president of this society, okay? And so the training program uh, uh, is, will be a stepwise international training program to fit into the, uh, the, uh, the practice uh, of the international doctors. And it will be a three-step uh, 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 training program. Uh, obviously, you know, down the road, we are keen to working with uh, uh, professional societies of uh, uh, of the given society, uh, given country, when uh, when the pro uh, service is established, you know, to bring to tailor the training program to the local doctor's needs, and also, uh, you know, to bring uh, a, a new technology uh, to the clinical 
uh, practice, okay, we also need to build the international consensus among the doctors, okay, and and in this case, because HIFU is currently the most mature uh, field for its application and deployment, actually is in the OB-GYN field, okay. So uh, by working with the regional and the national OG societies and the OG endoscopy societies, and also the fertility and reproductive medicine societies. Okay, so on the left, I just this is a, a, a representative of a few of the key uh, international organization, uh, professional organization has already formed the uh, collaboration with ISMIF. Okay, and to uh, bring this technology to the international platform. So we hope to introduce hypotherapy and the guidance of the professional societies so the doctors will be properly informed well trained and uh, and the uh, and the follow follow the uh, training program to be uh, well trained to master this technology uh, afterwards we have the well trained specialist okay will uh, deliver will integrate this technology into their medical practice and uh, to make the decision uh, 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 which technology to use uh, and to deliver this service to the patients. And also we want to, uh, by integrate the, uh, this uh, technology into the ob service practice, patients will also have a non-invasive option uh, to uh, choose. Okay, so currently the indi uh, indication, ob indications for high food uh, is, 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 uh, as I summarized in this slides, okay. So the uterine fibroids adenomyosis, uh, we have uh, performed the, the most uh, cases uh, from these two indications. And the, uh, the cesarean scar pregnancy and placenta accreta, the number of cases that we've been performed internationally and has increased Increasing. And the new to add to the, the indication is abdominal wall endometriosis. Okay, so the listing, the list of indications is increasing. Okay, and the China, the Chinese doctors, I who has already a um, uh, 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 good portion of them has already mastered this technology, are the pioneer of in the uh, uh, in broadening in uh, broadening. And this, the indications for high food, okay. And uh, we hope that you know upon uh, learning the tech, uh, learning the skills, uh, the this uh, new uh, uh, treatment method, okay. So the specialists actually will bring their own interests and uh, to the development of new indications for high food. Okay, so actually uh, for you, probably it's a new technology, but I, I would like to share with you that uh, cumulatively, okay, uh, we global cases of US guided high food therapy has already uh, uh, performed down um, uh, over 180,000 cases. And 95% 95, 95 of these actually are in the ob cases and mostly the uterine fibroids, adenomyosis. So in another words, okay, and uh, so we not only have uh, uh, evidence-based, uh, 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 evidence from clinical trials, but we also have in real life practice, okay, to, tell, to inform us that this technology actually is ready to be deployed globally uh, in the ob field especially for the treatment of uterine fibroids and adenomyosis, okay? And also like to share with you that, okay, we, we have already welcomed over 2,500 babies. Actually, the, we, the, the mothers call them HIFU babies because they were born to the, uh, to the mother and the patients who suffer from infertility due to the uh, benign uterine diseases, but uh, be, uh, realize the dream of the becoming a mother after receiving the treatment. Okay, and uh, so uh, for uh, Chongqing Haifu Medical is the uh, the uh, leading uh, leads the development of this field, both from the technology perspective, but also in the clinical uh, application and the clinical dissemination. So the end, uh, we already have end users in 29 countries and the regions of the global, and we have about 60 centers. Okay, so the first international center actually is the Oxford Hypo Center. 
and uh, we set it up in 2001. And so uh, Professor David Cranston in his talk actually will share with you his, the Oxford experience with this technology. And uh, so here is the, uh, some of the profiles uh, of our global end users. Okay, actually, uh, 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 if you're familiar with uh, what the President Xi called the Belt Road Initiative, our 60 centers has already covered uh, and the link that Belt Road uh, countries. Okay, and uh, so now we have uh, already three centers in Africa. So uh, the directors of all three centers are on the webinar. Okay, and uh, Dr. Raymond uh, 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 Satin from South African Center will share with you the, his exp uh, the experience uh, in, uh, the, uh, uh, with this technology. Actually, we are uh, working, and one thing I would like to mention that, you know, because uh, the, uh, the one, how we do it is that we integrate the hive service with the local medical communities, okay? In other words, uh, by training the local doctors and the medical teams uh, to master this technology, and uh, so we're handing the service to the local medical community, and uh, which allows them to serve the local patients more effectively and more uh, uh, efficiently and also uh, fits the local medical culture uh, better, okay? And I think this is very important, okay? So uh, actually we are now having several projects on, uh, undergoing, okay? Actually Zambia project is one of it, okay? So we envision that in next three to five years, we would like to have bring this technology in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, much rapid uh, uh, more uh, you know rapidly okay to uh, Africa because uh, we think this is a good technology uh, for Africa and uh, Dr. Raymond Sutton will will tell you in his uh, uh, talk and I think uh, uh, Professor Hamid and uh, uh, Dr. Ajayi will also uh, share with you uh, their experience in the question and answer period, okay? And uh, so here, for those of you who wonder how hard it is to set up a HIFO center, actually the requirement is much less than for setting up a, a operating theater, okay? Only a regular hospital room is required, okay? And uh, for the medical staff, it's a minimally um, a uh, high food doctor, a doc doctor, a nurse, and uh, an anesthesiologist. Actually, depending on uh, whether the doctor can do the sedation, because uh, for the ob procedures, only sedation is required, okay? So in many other countries, when the doctor can, can give the sedation agents, actually you don't need the anesthesiologist as well, okay? So it can be set up as an outpatient procedure, actually at the day service, okay, day surgery service uh, for the uh, benign and the uh, non-tumor diseases, non-malignant uh, uh, diseases. And the hospitalization is necessary for high food treatment for the malignant tumors, okay? So I think that the, most of the people who join this webinar are on the ob side, okay? But if the, uh, there's a doctor so on the oncology side, I think uh, usually we set up the uh, ob service first, then we'll be uh, 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 broadened to uh, other uh, disciplines, okay. And uh, so uh, we provide, uh, so Chongqing Health Medical is a, a provider of a total solution. I summarize the total solution here, okay. And to mention, uh, what need to be mentioned is that we, uh, in addition to the uh, the system and providing the system, uh, we have a comprehensive post the cell maintenance program, okay, and also has a complete uh, comprehensive clinical training program involving both uh, coming to China to train and on site training and on site clinical support. In addition, we have a build, uh, developed the telemedicine enabled the clinical support and uh, a post cell maintenance capability. Okay, in the next slides, I would uh, show a little bit more. And the uh, and uh, another uh, uh, thing worth mentioning is that okay, we it will also provide the participation in the activities of international academics and uh, academics. Okay, and uh, so this is uh, the 
uh, telemedicine service and the big data center. Okay, so we use this platform actually uh, to do telemedicine enabled treatment planning. Okay, for doctors who even learned uh, master this technology by encounter difficult cases. Okay, and uh, so in in this function, all doctors actually can through the telemedicine center uh, provide the clinical. Uh, uh, instructions, okay, uh, to the doctors, and the the, 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 the it's a, it feels like there's a doctor sit beside you, okay, and the, the delay and the four G is one second, so in five G it will be uh, uh, no delay, okay, and we also use this uh, uh, platform to do uh, 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 post cell maintenance, okay, and it's twenty four seven checking up the your system, okay. So we uh, therefore about seventy percent of the uh, small problems can the problems can be solved online, okay. And our training program also involves the training of a local engineer, okay. So so far we have linked to uh, the uh, 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 one hundred twenty centers. Uh, Within China and globally, okay. So for the uh, doctors who are on the oncology side or even on the OB/GYN side, and said, can we only use this to treat the benign conditions? Okay, the answer is no. Actually, you know, there is from this list to show you two things. One is that uh, Chongqing Health Medical, okay, actually leads the clinical development of, of uh, in this field. Almost all the first cases of treatment, uh, new indications were done on the, on the benign or uh, a malignant uh, tumor side is done by uh, uh, the Chongqing Hive, uh, the Chinese uh, team, okay? And uh, uh, so this also shows you, I think David will talk uh, more because the Oxford Center uh, uh, devotes a tremendous of their attention to bring this technology to oncology uh, to uh, practice, okay? So the answer is yes, okay? We we can uh, treat also use this technology to treat uh, malignant cancers. However, it is uh, need to be uh, developed more mature for uh, the global wide uh, uh, dissemination. Okay, so to finish my talk, I you know I will uh, use one uh, would like to use these two quotes. Okay, one is by from uh, Sir William Osler. Okay, who uh, is the founding father of modern medicine? Okay, and uh, 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 he says that diseases that harm requires therapies that harm less. Okay, and uh, the second quote is called "Treatments minimize harm to patients," and this is the core business value of Chongqing Haifu uh, Medical. Okay, um, thank you for your attention. Professor, thank you very much for your nice presentation. Sorry, I went off there. For those in Zambia, it's because we are using VPN yeah, in okay. China. Certain do not work out in China. There is no Google, no Facebook, no WhatsApp. In fact, even Zoom is not a platform that is allowed in China. So you need to go around certain things. Nonetheless, we will move on to the next speaker. In this case, we'll be moving to Professor David. I'm sorry, Prof, I was not there to give an introduction, but I asked Antonio to do that. Uh, so Prof David is actually an associate professor of surgery in the NAFU Department of Surgical Sciences, University of Oxford. He is the clinical director of high intensity focused ultrasound unit at Oxford and he is a governing body fellow of Green Templeton College in Oxford. He is the current president of International Society of Minimally Invasive and Virtual Surgery. He's an associate editor of the British Journal of Urology International e-learning modules from 2015 up to now. You may wish to note that he is actually an honorary consultant at the Oxford University Hospital. And the, more recently, he has been involved in renal autotransplantation for tumors in solitary kidneys, where he was involved in setting up Oxford as the national referral center for these complex cases. 
He is also an established trainer of doctors at Oxford University. He teaches in the urological department. So professor will tell us about the experience at Oxford University. Professor David. Thank you very much. Yours. Thank you very much. If I can share my screen. Uh, so can you can you see this? Yes, we can, David. Yeah. Yes, so, both. So there we go. So I have not visited Zambia. I would love to visit it. Um, let's just uh, move this on. But I did visit South Africa with Raymond a few years ago. And those were two of my pictures that I took in one of the game parks. So uh, I would love to come and visit uh, Zambia at some stage. But uh, here I uh, come from Oxford and uh, this is uh, the systems that we have had in Oxford. I'm not sure if whether you, uh, let me just see if I can get rid of this. I'll put it down there maybe for the moment. So um, we have had links with Chongqing uh, since uh, about 2000 for 20 years. This was our, the first unit that we built, which uh, although it looks very small, was actually the first purpose-built Haifu unit in uh, Western Europe. And we had this JC200 system. This is our new cancer center at the Churchill Hospital, but also has radiology department where we have the uh, JC200. Uh, and uh, like Rosie, um, we uh, look to William Osler, who uh, ended up uh, in Oxford, having been trained in K uh, Canada and then was one of the founding fathers of Johns Hopkins in the United States, but he ended his life in Oxford. And we've heard how ultrasound works, so I don't need to spend time about that. Obviously, most of the time we're looking at the image, but with HIFU, we're interested in the uh, absorption. If you put the power up 10,000 times, you can kill cells. We have done uh, quite a lot of different trials in Oxford, looking not only at fibroids, but these other things, which I'll talk about uh, in the next few minutes. And uh, we have uh, had treat clinical treatments funded mainly by trials. I'll talk about some of these. And we also have a big experimental section led by Professor Constantine Kousios, who is head of biomedical engineering in Oxford. So we have a very good collaboration with preclinical as well as clinical work. We started when in the early 2000s looking at liver and kidney cancer to get the uh, Chongqing Haifu JC machine C marked for Europe, looked primarily at the safety and toxicity and the performance of Haifu, looking at both liver tumors and kidney tumors in 56 patients. Uh, some we treated the tumors and looked radiologically. A few we treated the tumors and then we resected the tumor that had been treated and looked at the histology. And in the same way with the kidneys, uh, both some surgery where we removed the kidney after treatment and some just looking at the radiology. Uh, a few issues with skin burns, but very, very few side effects. And here is our early team. All of us are a little bit, especially me, a little bit older now. And this was the first patient ever treated in uh, the West. She had metastatic liver cancer uh, and died shortly after of her disease. But we um, allowed us to uh, treat her liver tumor. Uh, this person, David Weil, very sadly died of a brain tumor a number of years ago, but was instrumental with me in setting this up. So we 
uh, wrote up our early experience in the British Journal of Cancer, looking at the safety and feasibility of HIFU in a Western population. And as a result of these studies, the uh, machine was CE marked in 2005. We then had uh, various other kidney trials looking at the ablation of a large mass and then histology and small renal masses, then histology and small renal masses and then histology. We also looked at laparoscopic HIFU and various translational, um, various translational studies as well. And on one of the renal, subsequent renal treatments with 17 patients, 15 completed their stay, one went on to surgery, but 14 of the 14, 10 remained under surveillance with good treatment, four required other treatments, one RFA and three radiofrequency ablation and three surgery. But here's an example of an early one that we did. I think you can see a contrast uptake here, 12 days after HIFU, lack of contrast uptake, and um, six months, uh, and indeed a year, and indeed uh, five years later, uh, there was still uh, no uptake in that area of tumor that had been treated. So it was all had been totally ablated. Uh, a colleague uh, with a different system looked at laparoscopic HIFU. Of course, that is non that is invasive. Um, but we did demonstrate that it, it would work. And uh, we did laparoscopic HIFU on this patient and then took the uh, tumor out and showed the area of ablation. But of course, um, laparoscopic HIFU is invasive and we have not pursued that. One of the problems with kidneys, or the two problems basically, that we found are ribs that can get in the way of treatment, but also perinephric fat, the fat around the kidney. And here in the CT scan, all this uh, dark area is fat around the kidney. And one of the reasons why it was not working so well with kidneys was we thought because of the absorption of fat. So what we did is we looked at 10 patients who were undergoing renal cancer surgery and we removed perinephric fat and as fresh tissue we put it in a saline water bath at 37 degrees centigrade and performed experiments on it fairly quickly um, 10 times with different thickness of fat between transducers and this is what we found that if the thick thickness of fat was two centimeters then the intensity of output went down to 58 percent and as the thickness of fat increased then so um, the intensity of output uh, decreased to down to about a quarter. Now uh, here uh, I was also involved for a while in renal transplants and we had a couple of patients who had tumors in a renal transplant. Here's one. And the, uh, we treated two of these with HIFU and uh, you may be aware that if you do a transplant on a patient, when you're transplanting the kidney, you remove all the fat from it and you put it in the iliac fossa so that it's not underneath the ribs. And that me me meant it was much easier to treat. And here's a post-treatment, which I then removed this tumor from the kidney and found that uh, everything had been completely ablated just apart from a slight rim of a tumor that was left. So that was much easier to treat. Um, in terms of fibroids, uh, you will all be uh, aware of this, so I don't need to talk about this, but here is one of the cases that we treated. And I'm sure Raymond, who has much more experience of fibroids than we do, will will tell you about this, but um, here's one uh, case and you can see how uh, after two weeks and after two years, very good ablation uh, of this um, fibroid. 
And we were involved in helping to write up and direct this 20 center study. And although uh, all these cases were done in China, we were very involved through the Surgical Interventions Trials Unit and the Department of Surgery in uh, helping to construct this paper. And this was a very important paper. It was very important also for us in the UK to get this uh, technology NICE approved. And we looked at these various uh, issues in China um, and basically 1300 people re 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 received HIFU, 472 hysterectomy, 586 myomectomy. And the um, quality of life improved more rapidly after HIFU. Um, and the advent of major adverse of, uh, events were much less in HIFU than in the surgical cases. And uh, many of these patients came from uh, quite far away, which is why the hospital stay for HIFU was four days, um, as opposed to these other days. But I think most people who are treating uh, fibroids with HIFU um, can be done as a day case. I think that's what Chongqing are doing now. We, uh, when we were starting this, just kept them overnight just to be absolutely sure um, that everything was all right, but none of them had um, any problems. And this, uh, as Rosie has already said, was written up in the British Journal of Obstetric and Gynecology and uh, a very important paper really, especially for us in the West for uh, getting this NICE approved. We uh, did an earlier trial just on a few patients um, much fewer patients, but this was our Oxford experience with improved symptom scores during the two year follow up and fibroid volume and reduction rate also during the two year follow up. And of course, unlike radiotherapy, uh, if uh, the symptoms recur or if it's a very large fibroid and you can't treat it in one setting, you can always treat it on a subsequent occasion. There's no limit to the number of treatments that you can give. So as a result of that work, uh, we presented this work to uh, National Institute for Clinical Excellence, and that was accepted in 2019. And we're gonna go back to them next year after three years just to, um, we have to report, obviously we haven't done that many cases during COVID, but we will see if we can just continue to uh, get that approved and extended. So a prostate machine, uh, there are um, uh, no um, Chongqing machines in clinical use at the moment, um, but the prostate machines that we have been using, uh, French Ablotherm and Sonoblate um, for transrectal prostate and the increasing number of results with this show that the effect is as good as other lies, localized treatment. The issue with prostate cancer is that most people die with prostate cancer rather than because of prostate cancer and mortality is not a useful outcome due to the nature of the disease, which is often a very long standing one. Uh, certainly if treatment is possible, then even if you don't treat the long term uh, risks of death are very low and it's been shown that if you're suitable for treatment um, then it's only likely to make a difference after about 15 years to mortality. Some people present with extensive metastatic prostate cancer and they're not suitable for primary treatment anyway. So those that are suitable for treatment uh, whether you treat them or not are going to last quite a long time and if you treat them the benefit is only shown after about uh, 15 years. This is um, some patients with sacral chordoma that we treated. Sacral chordoma is a locally invasive and very unpleasant disease, not officially a cancer, but here was some very uh, nasty uh, localized growths in the sacrum. Here was somebody who was unable to sit down because of these growths in the sacrum. And uh, first treatment, we ablated one, second treatment ablated the other. And this took away their pain. 
and um, made them able to sit down. And again, uh, potentially you can treat that later on if it recurs. This was written up in the British Journal of Neurosurgery in 2017. We currently have another uh, ongoing trial for sarcomas, which has just been funded, which we have just started. This is a, a very interesting uh, type that we are doing, looking at targeted drug delivery. And this is done with my colleague, Constantine Kousios, and in fact, Paul Lyon, uh, who's a trainee in radiology, did his PhD on this work. And this is using uh, HIFU in a slightly non-focused way to heat up a tumor. And what happens is that if you take um, liposomes, which are a bit like butter, so liposomes are stable at 37 degrees centigrade, but they break open at 42 degrees centigrade. And you can take liposomes and you can put a cytotoxic drug, doxyrubicin, into the middle of them. And uh, as I say, these remain stable at body temperature, but at 42 degrees centigrade, the drug is released. So what happens with this is that we were looking at targeted drug delivery for liver tumors. And this was the first study that had ever been done in uh, humans, in man, looking at safety and uh, also the viability and the radiological response. So what happens is that you have a patient with a liver tumor. This was, these were secondaries from mainly secondaries from colorectal cancer. And then you take a biopsy of it so that you know what the histology is. And then you can inject, uh, you can uh, measure the temperature and take the biopsy. And then you take this, what's called thermodox, these liposomes with the doxyrubicin in, and you inject them peripherally into the circulation. And then you take a slightly non-focused beam and you heat up the tumor to about 42 degrees centigrade. And then what happens is that you, um, the, the tumor, uh, as the drug goes through the tumor, it breaks open and you get, you get um, targeted drug delivery and you get two to nine fold increase in the tumor, intratumor thermodoxy uh, rubicin. And here you can see various tumors and one was chosen which was heated up and after treatment, six days after treatment, there is no take up of contrast in that. And uh, here again, uh, another demonstration just showing how uh, after treatment, two weeks after treatment, you have targeted drug delivery and it increases the dose in the tumor by about eightfold to what uh, just ordinary peripheral cytotoxic drugs do. And this was written up in The Lancet in Oncology in 2018. And we have just started a pancreatic trial looking uh, both at uh, um, targeted drug delivery and ablation. This was an early treatment that uh, Professor Wu, Feng Wu, who's been with us for the last 20 years, but was intimately involved in developing HIFU in China, uh, in the 1990s, looked at eight patients with unresectable prostate cancer and abdominal pain. And although this doesn't cure the cancer, uh, it can delay the recurrence, but also it uh, cures the pain. Uh, and with uh, it's often difficult to control pancreatic pain with even with uh, opioids, with morphine, but targeted drug delivery with the HIFU did stop the pain. And here's a one that we did in Oxford. It's slightly difficult to see, but I think you can see contrast uptake there and lack of contrast uptake um, after, after treatment. Um, I, I just finish off with this quote, which um, I, I think is, I'll, I'll read it out to you. Um, I, it's a very famous quote by Theodore Roosevelt that you may, may know, but I, I think that with HIFU, 
it is the people who are actually doing the work that sometimes we get criticized for doing it by people who are not doing it. But I think he was, uh, when he said this, it's not the critic that counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man or woman who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcomings but who does not actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. I think that is a very good... Um, basically conclusion for all those who've been involved in HIFO over the last uh, 20 and more years. It's some uh, technology which I think is going to grow and grow over the next few years. And we're very fortunate in Oxford to have had a great team who have all been very enthusiastic about this um, over many years. And uh, certainly we find in Oxford that the interest and the indications and the technology is growing um, day by day and month by month. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for that uh, passionate pr presentation. I think this is what was missing in the last uh, meeting we had with the Zambians, um, especially that we also invited the oncologists to attend. We will quickly go into our last presentation before we, into, we go into the panel discussion or question and answer session. So we have Dr. Raymond from South Africa who will be presenting on HIFO application and its economics in South Africa. Uh, you may wish to know that the, Dr. Raymond has been a consultant gynecologist for over 24 years, since 1986. Uh, he is the vice president of the International Society of Minimally Invasive and Virtual Surgery. It's a shame I didn't know Dr. Raymond earlier, and he, especially that he's at Baraguana. You know, we know Baraguana as a place where if you are learning emergency surgery, you will see all the different types of trauma at that hospital in one night, in your first call, you will see everything. Uh, he trained at VIDS, and he is a trainer of doctors, but more important, he's actually head of the gynecological unit, and he is head of the HIFE unit since January 2016. And being closer to home, I think he will share insights that he as Zambians, we can, we can also look forward to. Dr. Raymond, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I would, uh, good morning, everybody. Ni hao to those in China. Um, I'd just like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to speak at this uh, webinar. Um, I'm Dr. Raymond Setson from Chris Hani Baragwanath Academic Hospital in Soweto. And I'm going to be talking about halfway application and its health economics in South Africa. Uh, why is it not? Um... No. Uh, go go out. bottom left, Raymond, on the arrow. Bottom left on the arrow. Yeah, that goes backwards. Other one goes forwards. Yeah. I don't know why it's not. Um... Let me, let me just quickly, sorry, let me just quickly get my daughter to come here. That, that's how I was having to do it. Yeah, earlier on it was working fine. I don't know what, it, um, so if I click on there. If you click on the right arrow, it will go. 
Go there down the bottom. Let me just check and see if it's. Why is it not? Uh, it's not letting me. Not letting me change the slides. Stop the sharing. Probably re re. Well, I was I was having to do it on the little arrows down at the bottom left hand corner. Where where is that? Okay. On the, on the, on the move your th move your move your thing to the left. Other way. Yeah, down there, down there, down okay. there. Okay, that goes backwards. That one goes backwards. And the one to the right of that will go forwards. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Okay, so I'm going to start my talk now. So we're talking about half application and it's health economics in South Africa. Now it's not doing it again. Uh, wrong, okay. wrong arrow. It's the other arrow. Now I got it. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background about Krasani Baragwanath Academic Hospital. Um, it's the largest hospital in Africa and in the Southern Hemisphere. And it's quoted as being the third largest hospital in the world based on, on, uh, beds, on beds. We have approximately 4,000 beds in our hospital. Um, and we service the needs of Soweto, which is a, a black urban settlement bordering on Johannesburg. And uh, there's a population of about 5 million people in Soweto. So the one hospital supplying the 5 million people. Um, in, in Soweto, there's a, a lot of informal settlements and you can see with outside toilets, um, but there's also uh, formal proper houses as well. It's a government hospital and we're affiliated to the University of the Witwatersrand, which is one of our biggest and uh, our best universities. Uh, we are the largest training hospital in South Africa. The vast majority of the patients that we treat at, at our hospital are black patients. Um, we're the first half a centre in Africa. We got our machine in 2015. And uh, the vast majority of patients that are treated at our hospital receive free treatment. This is just the, the entrance to our hospital. It's a very busy hospital, um, as I'm sure most of the hospitals in Africa are. Uh, if you go to any of the casualty areas or any of the special clinics, you'll find lots and lots of patients waiting to be treated. Um, here are just different clinics that you can see, and one of them is our, our Ghana outpatient department. Um, if you look at the health system in South Africa, it's divided between private and the public sectors. The private sector accounts for only about 15% of the population. Um, and this is funded by medical aids, and this applies to the, mainly the middle and higher income, income groups. Um, the public sector is the vast majority of our population, uh, more than 85% of the population. These patients are treated in government hospitals. These are patients of the lower income groups or no income. And as I mentioned before, the treatment is free. And most of these hospitals are, are chronically underfunded, understaffed and overloaded with patients. The population of South Africa, we have a population of about 58 million people. And what's interesting is that half of the population are black females. So you'll see later on in the talk why this is, why this is so important. Looking at the, the profile of fibroids, um, particularly at our hospital, the majority of patients that we see in our Ghana outpatient departments um, of patients with fibroids and the related complications, uh, mainly um, abnormal bleeding, anemias, dysmenorrhea, and uh, infertility. And uh, the prevalence of uterine fibroids is three to five times more common in, in black women than in Asian or Caucasian women. So with fibroids being so prevalent and with having such a large female population, you can see that we are our hospital is inundated with um, fibroid patients. If you look at the profile of our, of our patients, as, as I mentioned before, they're mostly black females. Uh, the vast majority are on the obese side. We have a very high incidence of HIV. Um, our patients are late presenters, so most of them will present with a large uterus with multiple fibroids. Um, another interesting factor, uh, usually fibroids present 30, 35 years of age. We see patients as young as 18-year-olds 
presenting with large 12 centimeter fibroids. Um, and also their symptoms are, are very severe. Uh, we also have a large um, proportion of our, of our patients are infertile. But again, this is not only due to fibroids, we have uh, a lot of pelvic inflammatory disease and male factors as well. So just in terms of the obesity, and this is important when it comes to surgery, um, by the age of 20, probably half of the females in, in, in South Africa are overweight. And by the age of 45, this has increased to about 82%. So you have all the complications with traditional treatments such as surgery, uh, laparotomy, um, wound infection, wound breakdown, and the surgery itself is very difficult. Also, as I mentioned before, our high rate of HIV infection, probably about 25% of, of women in the reproductive age at our hospital are HIV positive. And when you're operating on, on, on big multi-fibroid uteruses, there's always a danger that somebody, one of the medical staff, um, whether they're trying to um, give you better exposure or they're swabbing or something, uh, blood away where you're operating, there's a very good chance that someone's going to get pricked or cut. So there's a, we're, very, we, we're very careful with our, when operating on these HIV patients. As I mentioned, um, they present late. This is for um, a number of reasons. They first go to traditional healers and herbalists. And when all of these fail, only then do they come to us uh, for treatment. A lot of them, especially the infertile patients, see a mass growing in the abdomen, think they might be pregnant and, they, and therefore don't do anything about it. Um, as I said, they, they don't come for routine checks usually. There is a, a, a marked fear of hospitals and, and a fear of surgery. So these are reasons why our patients present late. And as a result, this is the kind of uteruses that we see. Uh, big, massive, multi-fibroid uteruses. This is what the MRIs look like. Um, in terms of infertility, um, this is very important because there's a lot of, um, we know with, we've got nine different tribal groups and they have all their different traditions and cultural beliefs. And one of these is that in order to get married, you have to be fertile. So a woman who can't produce a child um, won't, won't be able to get married. And also the, the greater the number of children that you have, the higher your, your, your social status. So therefore there's an intense desire to preserve the uterus. So again, when we have a patient with a, a large multi-fibroid uterus and we, we mention myomectomy and make them sign for hysterectomy in case we, we, we can't stop the bleeding or something, then they refuse surgery. So um, infertility is a big issue and these patients are very worried about losing their uterus. Socioeconomic issues. Um, at the moment, there's the, 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 what's the name? The unemployment in South Africa is very high. And patients who are coming in for, for traditional treatment, like a myomectomy or hysterectomy, they're gonna be off work for a minimum of about six weeks. Um, so it's very difficult for them to get leave and they worry that when they get back from leave, they might've lost their jobs. So again, a lot of the time they, they will delay having surgery. So what is the burden of, of traditional treatment of fibroids on, on, on the healthcare system? So for us, admissions, as I said, our, our, our wards are very full. Um, a patient who's coming in for a, a myomectomy or a hysterectomy will be in hospital for a minimum of six days um, if everything goes well. If there's any complications, obviously that will be longer. So there's a massive cost burden on the state for all of these patients. Even though it's a government hospital, it's worked out that it's around about 3,000 rand in our South African money per day to have a patient in hospital. Um, and also this leads to overcrowding of the wards. Um, again, when you're operating on these big uh, uh, fibroid uteruses, you usually lose quite a lot of blood and you probably will need to transfuse patients one or two units of blood. Uh, blood is expensive. It's a scarce commodity in South Africa. So this is another problem for us um, using traditional treatment for fibroids. And as well, on our surgical list, we've got a backlog of over 450 patients um, waiting for myomectomy and hysterectomy. And this means that patients are going to wait at, at least another eight months to a year 
in which case the, the, the fibroids are going to get bigger and the symptoms are going to uh, deteriorate. So just looking at the development of, of fibroid treatment over the years, you can see how we've gone from very invasive procedures like a, a laparotomy for a myomectomy or hysterectomy, uh, going on to less invasive but still invasive vaginal hysterectomies. And then you move on to your minimally invasive procedures um, where you're now using um, endoscopy, so laparoscopy, hysteroscopy, and also uterine artery embolization. Um, and now with HIFU, we've got a totally non-invasive procedure, which is based on, on, on ultrasound imaging. This is a machine that we have at, at uh, Baraguanath. It's uh, the model JC200. Um, looking at the, the healthcare benefits of, of, of HIFU um, for the hospital. So as we've mentioned before, uh, the patients who are coming in for a, for a laparotomy would be there for six days. We are now doing our patients as a day case. So they will come in in the morning, they'll have their procedure. Uh, we wait until they fully awake from their, from their conscious sedation. And two or three hours later, they go home. So we don't have any more hospital admissions. So there's a decreased cost on the state. The wards are more manageable. No general anesthetic is given, it's done under conscious sedation. So we freed up our theaters for more urgent cases, uh, ectopic pregnancies, malignancies, uh, all those kind of cases, which also have a long waiting list. Um, as uh, Professor Cranston mentioned earlier, it's, a, it's, it's um, no, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm confused over here. It's, it's totally non-invasive, so there's no blood loss. Um, and as I said before, blood is expensive and it's a scarce commodity. There's no blood loss with this patient, so we don't have to worry about blood transfusions. And there's no risk of HIV transmission. No, we don't have to worry about needle stick injuries. Um, there's no um, uh, involvement with the patient. The patient lies on the table and we're working from a, off a computer. So it's a very safe procedure with very low risk of complications. Um, when you're operating on these big uh, fibroids, the chance of damaging bowel, bladder, the ureters is very high. Um, with us, because it's such targeted, um, precise management, we don't have these injuries. Uh, what are the, the benefits to the patient? Well, as we said before, being a day case, then they don't have to be admitted. You know, with our patients, they have to organize people to come and look after their houses, to come and look after their uh, their families, um, so they don't have to worry about that. They're in and out on the same day. Because they're only given conscious sedation, the recovery is very quick. Within a couple of hours, they're fine. Um, they return to work within days. Uh, I'll show later on um, how much time they usually get off with the different kind of procedures, but uh, they normally return back to work within days. So job security is, uh, is very important here. Um, because it's non-invasive, uh, you've got uterine sparing. If you're doing a, a myomectomy on a patient with multiple fibroids, sometimes they bleed, you can't stop the bleeding, or you've removed so much, so many fibroids that there's, there's very little uterus to reconstruct and you need to um, continue with the emergency hysterectomy. With our procedure, that, we, that doesn't happen. The uterus is spared, so they retain their fertility. The myometrium is not even damaged. We, we, we spare the myometrium. So if the patients fall pregnant, they can have a normal vaginal delivery. Whereas if they had a myomectomy, they would have to have a, a cesarean section. Um, as we mentioned before, they can return to their normal activities, exercise, etc., quickly within days. And the other beauty is there's no adhesions. After a myomectomy, we usually find marked adhesions in the abdomen, bowel stuck all over the uterus, momentum. Um, with this procedure, there's no adhesions at all. Um, and this is a point where uh, Prof. Cranston mentioned earlier on, there's no ionizing radiation. So um, the treatment can be repeated as often as you like. Um, so sometimes when we've got a patient with multiple fibroids, we can't treat them all at one session. So we'll treat, say, four or five fibroids, and then bring them back in a couple of months and treat the others. Um, and if we have treated a fibroid and we haven't got 100% um, ablation, we can always go back and treat more on that fibroid. Again, there's no damage to ovaries. So 
with like uterine artery embolization, there is a chance that you can um, cause damage to the ovaries by blocking off the blood supply there and getting premature ovarian failure. With us, we, we're far away from the ovaries. There's no damage to ovaries. And also it's important in our young ladies, they don't want to have scars on the abdomen. So cosmetic reasons are also important here. This is what the, the skin looks like after treatment with your different kinds of treatment. There you've got, first of all, you've got your laparotomy with a, a nice scar there. Laparoscopy, even though there's less scarring, you've still got multiple little scars. And with the HAFU, the abdomen is completely normal. Just to show you the, the comparison of recovery time for the different procedures, uh, with the ultrasound guided HAFU, which is what we do, we do ultrasound as opposed to MRI, um, one to two days. Um, the pain they have is very short lived after the procedure. Within one to two days, they can go back to normal activities. If they were having a, a laparotomy and a hysterectomy or a myomectomy, uh, they normally get booked off about six weeks. Um, for laparoscopic procedures, it's two to three weeks, and for uterine artery embolization, it's usually two weeks. Just to show you quickly some of the South African results, uh, to date we've treated 525 patients, um, age, mean age of uh, 31.5 years, ranging from 18 up to 45. We, our cutoff was initially 45. Because uh, we, we were sort of um, more concerned with fertility, but we've now gone up to age of 50. Um, we don't go beyond 50 because we're just worried about uh, Lyme sarcomas. Um, as you can see, the weight of our patients on average is about 79 kilograms. Um, the biggest patient we had was 115 kilograms. And abdominal wall thickness. One of the issues with the abdominal wall thicknesses, you shouldn't go beyond six centimeters because uh, then there's an increased chance of burning the skin. So on average, ours was around about five centimeters. So you know, our patients are on the big side. Um, just to show you here, most of the fibroids that we treated were on the anterior surface of the uterus. Most of them were intramural. Um, the other thing that we look at that's important when treating the fibroids is to on your MRI, you look at the T2 signal intensity and you, um, you work out whether they are hypo intense, which means they are darker compared to the surrounding myometrium. This means they're less vascular and they're easier to treat, whereas the hyper um, means that they, they, they're brighter than the surrounding myometrium, usually more vascular, and they're going to be very difficult to treat. So luckily ours were mostly um, easier to treat. If you look at the symptoms that all our patients con, uh, complained of uh, before treatment, uh, the vast majority complained of dysmenorrhea, menorrhagia. Um, a lot of our patients, because they're late presenters, had anemia, HP, HP is below 12. Infertility is, as we mentioned, a big issue. And then also constipation and uh, urinary, urinary symptoms. Um, adverse events during the half food treatment. This is done under conscious sedation. So, and, um, the, and the patients will complain of, of some pain. Lower abdominal pain is, is, is normal because we are creating ischemia in the fibroid. And 70, about 78% of the patients complained of that. It's usually of short duration and it's usually managed by the anaesthetist. Um, some of them, especially if you've got posterior fibroids, complain of sciatic or buttock pain. Burning sensation on the skin, uh, you've got to be careful of because uh, we can get skin burns, 31% had that, and 14% uh, had transient leg pain, which is also, you need to be very careful of. Um, in terms of major adverse events that we've had so far with our over 500 patients, we've only had two cases of first degree skin burns, which were managed conservatively and, and, and healed spontaneously within two weeks, and none of them required grafting or anything. We haven't had a single bowel injury, bladder injury, or, or, or ureteric injury. Um, we've had two cases of nerve injury where the patient had um, some pain down the leg, for, and, and that also uh, resolves spontaneously within about six weeks. Um, all the patients get um, quality of life um, scores before and after treatment. And if you look at the before, 
uh, the quality of life, the score was low, around about 35. And you can see how after one month, three months, six, 12, 24 months, the quality of life improved. And after two years, we monitored them up to two years, the score had gone up to about 75. So there was a marked improvement in the quality of life. Um, we also do uh, symptom severity scores on all the patients pre and post. And um, you can see that before the treatment, the, the, the severity of their symptoms was, was, was high, just below 60. And how with time it dropped and down at two years, it had dropped down to below 20. So there was a marked improvement in their symptoms as well. Um, shrinkage rates, we found uh, on, on the first 100 patients, this was done um, at one month, it was about 31%. Uh, up to 52% at three months, 61% at six months, and around about 73% at, uh, at one year. In terms of fertility successes, we've had 22 cases of pregnancy. Eight, are, eight patients are, are currently pregnant at the moment. Uh, we had one four kilogram vaginal delivery. Um, we've had 13 term cesarean deliveries. Um, uh, of which one was twins. Um, and this, these figures, we might even have a higher number of pregnancies. The problem is we have very poor uh, follow-up with our patients, especially patients who are coming from, we have a lot of patients coming from out of our borders and from other provinces. Um, and often what happens is they'll fall pregnant and they just uh, don't communicate with us and just continue seeing their doctors wherever they are. So our numbers could be even higher, we're not sure. Uh, this is just a baby gallery to show you some of the pregnancies that we've had. Uh, these are just some of the cases that we've done. A 40-year-old patient, you can see pre hafu the fibroid there, and then you can see one and a half months later, it's now ablated. The, the, most of the, the fibroid is ablated, um, and it's already shrunk by about 27%. Um, in this case here, in this 32-year-old, you can see the fibroid there. Uh, four months post HIFU, uh, also about 98% ablation, shrinkage was really about 63%. Uh, this is a 27 year old patient, this is at 23 days, ablation rate about 71%, and it's already shrunk just to about 10% after one month. It's a 42 year old with multiple fibroids. Um, two days post treatment, you can already see. Uh, quite marked ablation of, of the fibroids. So in conclusion, um, for us, HIFU has assisted in, in, in transforming women's healthcare in, in South Africa. It's made a huge difference to them in terms of their, of their symptoms, their quality of life. It's a safe and effective alternative treatment for, for uterine fibroids in black women. Uh, from the patient's perspective, uh, the uterus the most important thing, the uterus is retained and therefore their fertility is retained. They have a quick recovery, they're back to work, they're back to normal activity, exercise within a couple of days. They can have a normal vaginal delivery post uh, um, um, treatment, which is important for us because <clears throat> in our hospital, we have a, a waiting list of emergency seizures. At any one time, we could have 20, 25 emergency seizures on the board. So if we can get away with doing uh, normal vaginal deliveries, Will make a big difference to us. <clears throat> and from the health system perspective, being a day case, the hospital admissions are reduced, therefore the costs are reduced, the wards are, are more manageable, uh, there's a marked decrease in the blood requirements, and um, patients are getting quicker access to treatment instead of waiting up to a year for surgery. So in Africa at the moment, we've got one machine right up at the, at the north of Africa in Egypt, uh, we've recently got a machine in Nigeria and right at the bottom in the south in South Africa, we've got a machine. So we've got three machines in Africa um, at the moment. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Raymond, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, I remember during the introduction, I was unable to complete due to technical challenges. But we are having three presentations that have been presented. But I would also want to introduce two panelists as we are going into our last 20 minutes of the scheduled time. 
and because I didn't complete the introduction, I didn't mention to say, when we visited HIFO, we did a report to the Minister of Health of Zambia. We later went back and we had a meeting with the team of experts in Zambia. Minister of Health was quite happy with the technology, but Minister of Health does not make decisions. And they insisted that experts who have been using HIFO be linked to the experts in Zambia. And Zago has been very instrumental in organizing the experts. And I'm sure after the presentations, they have certain concerns, questions, and some clarifications. So the last 20 minutes, 20 minutes will be dedicated to that. But allow me to introduce the other two panelists. And I will request Dr. Schumer to introduce the executive members or the prominent experts that are there. I cannot see them for now. Uh, we have Prof. Mohammed from Egypt. Uh, he is a professor of interventional radiology, Cairo University in Egypt. And his machine, which is in the north, is actually in a private setting. He is the founder of Haifu Egypt, the first private, private center of focused ultrasound treatment of tumors in the Middle East and Africa. He is an elected fellow of Arab Society of Inter Interventional Radiology, and he is a board member of the Egyptian Society of Interventional Radiology. We have another interesting panelist. This one is the, no other than Dr. Ajay. Dr. Ajay is actually a fellow of the Western uh, College of Surgeons, West African College of Surgeons. And the, Dr. Ajay was actually driven by passion to help enhance the quality of medical service in his country of Nigeria. And he started Nodika Fertility Center in Lagos, pioneering a wide range of assisted reproductive services across the nation. The clinic specializes in in vitro fertilization and the treatment of infertility for couples facing fertility challenges in marriages and has since inception expanded into two other major cities in Nigeria. And he is the first to introduce HIFO in Nigeria. So you are welcome as panelists. Dr. Schumer, any members, prominent members of the executive that you'd want to introduce? As soon as we introduce them, yeah, thank you we'll so much. The... Yes, Doc? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Mzaza. And uh, thank you so much to the presenters. Uh, I am hearing the presentations for the second time. Um, and there's no doubt, uh, basically, that uh, this is a technology that uh, Zambia needs. Uh, as we have heard already from you, that Ministry of Health is already in agreement that we need this technology. Yeah, so unfortunately, we do not have the full executive with us this morning due to other competing activities. But we do have, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, acknowledge that uh, oncology is here and head of oncology, Dr. Luis Banda is here. And I've also seen Dr. Paul. Kamfwa. Kamfwa, although he's a gynecologist, but he's okay, so Kamfwa, yes, it's very good to see him here. Greetings, Doc. Um, we have uh, from our executive, we have uh, Dr. Mwansa Keti Lubea, uh, who has been instrumental in spearheading uh, some of the OBGY uh, activities uh, in Zambia. We have uh, Dr. Vanilla Banda, 
we have Victor Sichone uh, all the way from the uh, Copper Belt uh, province of Zambia uh, on the call. And we do have uh, Dr. Chambwa, uh, who is also a gynecologist. Uh, yeah, so basically these are the members that are here this morning, but we do also have, I think, non-OBGY members who have joined, and this is very uh, gratifying. We are so grateful that uh, they joined us. Uh, as you know, uh, HIFU will affect a lot of women, so we did extend invitation to some of the women uh, we do have a, a, a women's association um, and some of these now are coming from uh, that forum, Dr. Montanga Mapani, although pediatrician, but uh, her interest here. And also uh, we know that pediatrics is also affected by uh, the oncological issues. So it is good to see that the pediatricians are also uh, joining. Uh, we do have uh, Cynthia Shawa here, and um, is there anyone else that needs acknowledgement? I think basically this is, oh, I hope I have not left any one of us out. So we are so grateful to the team for organizing, for bringing us together. Uh, my appeal would be that we share the presentation and uh, we should be able to discuss this as members log in and uh, they listen in, understand the concept, and uh, we should be able to forge ahead with this uh, initiative. So thank you very much, Dr. Mzaza. And thank you to the team for the wonderful uh, thanks, presentation. The floor is open to questions. Antonio, I may not be able to see the hands. Please, you can help me point out those who have raised their hands to ask or to make a comment. The floor is open. We can open the uh, camera and uh, microphone. Really, any doctor want to ask the questions? Dr. Muhammad, your hand is up, so please. Yeah, yes. Can you... Yeah, uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and uh, good afternoon uh, for my friends in China. Uh, I think this is a great moment uh, to see uh, more, than, uh, center, more than one center in Africa. As we started this 10, uh, nine years ago, now I am very happy to see our motherland, Africa, uh, to uh, invite this very uh, prime technology to help our people in Africa. I'm very happy to share this presentation with, David, uh, with Professor David and my friend Raymond, and of course, my dear friend, uh, Ruzi. Uh, I, 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 uh, I just want to say to all of our friends in Africa, uh, we have a good experience in Africa now, Dr. Raymond, Dr. Uh, Ajaye, and our center. Our center now did more than 500. Okay, sorry, kids. we have lost you. And now, you, no, it's okay now? Yeah, Hello? we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, I, I think this is a good time to promote this technology in our motherland, Africa and to broad the spectrum of usage of HIFU. You can see Dr. David Cranston and, and his team in Oxford use HIFU in, uh, in many diseases like uh, sarcoma, like uh, HCC, like uh, hepatic metastasis. And we are also in Egypt applying this treatment for many diseases, malignant and benign. So I think we should push so much uh, applications of HIFU and uh, uh, our center is opened all the time 
to all my friends in Africa, if you need any help, and of course, uh, Shangqing University and Haifu uh, company uh, provide all of support. And this is a great moment, uh, like an emotional moment, not only the scientific moment, because this is a good and big dream to see this technology in many African countries. I am very happy to hear that Zambia will open a center and that I, wa I was very happy when Dr. Ajaye opened his centers also. This is just uh, a, greetings from, a greeting from my side to all my friends in Africa. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, may I ask you uh, to make a comment because I know there are oncologists that also uh, uh, attend this webinar. As a yeah. Radiologist, okay. I know you have also broadened the indications uh, beyond the oncology and into interventional radiology, where you can treat these those uh, uh, those indications are for uh, intervention radiology. So, can you make a comment on that? So, the uh, the uh, attend the uh, the expert attend this webinar will also know uh, the potential of this technology. Or yes. Yes. Yes, uh, Rosie. Uh, in Egypt, we uh, expand the application. Uh, we did more than 100 cases of pancreatic cancer with very good results. Uh, if, uh, the, like Dr. David uh, said to us, Dr. Cranston, uh, oh, maybe the only treatment if the small size pancreatic cancer, maybe adjuvant for chemotherapy and medium-sized pancreatic cancer, and maybe as a palliative pain management in large-sized pancreatic cancer. Also, we introduce uh, uh, a new technique in Egypt, uh, treatment of cholangiocarcinoma uh, for uh, pillary uh, tree. We treated uh, maybe uh, nine to 10 cases of cholangiocarcinoma with very good results. We treated a multiple uh, broad spectrum of metastatic lesion from colon, from breast, and uh, from uh, pancreas. Also, we treated uh, metastatic bony lesions in the pelvis, in the chest wall, in the humerus, uh, with very good results, especially regarding to the pain management. I noticed there is a pediatrician in our uh, audience we treated a uh, few numbers of, uh, uh, of pediatrics age group uh, treating uh, aggressive fibromatosis and treated uh, aneurysmal bone cysts in assistance of other interventional method and uh, with, with very good result in uh, fibromatosis and the small tumor. Uh, and uh, I treated last uh, month a very uh, astonishing case of uh, this my tumor insinuated in the hepatic hilum originating from the duodenal uh, wall and we waiting for the result and this is uh, this patient not applicable for any type of surgery uh, so I think uh, with your help as a changing and with the help of the society we can provide a long list of treatment also, of course, our main this is from uh, uterine wall endometriosis. We treated all of this, and I I want to tell you, uh, don't worry. The HIFO is very safe treatment, but you must uh, train very well. You must uh, follow the rules of high uh, of the treatment. Uh, take time, take your time to make a decision. Make a plan before treating the patient. Please, please, please do, do a simulation before treating the patient. Prank the patient one time before the treatment and put, put her or him on the machine. Make a clear plan mm -hmm. for the treatment. Make a decision. All of us, uh, like in Chongqing, uh, in Oxford, in Egypt, can give you an advice. Of course, the Chinese doctors are the most expert, all of us uh, learning from them. And the second time when you're treating the patient, treat very good. 
Uh, we also provide a good improvement in anesthesia technique. This is very important. At the beginning, we put the cancer patient in deep anesthesia. Now we put all the patient on conscious sedation level, no need for hospital stay. All of our malignant patient leaving the center after four or five hours directly to the home, we make sure there is no complication. And this is, I think this is a good achievement for uh, most of us. Uh, so please uh, be happy uh, to introduce this technology in your country. And if you need any help, any help we are here, all of us uh, in your pack, because this is like a dream to see our motherland uh, promoting this technology to our poor people and private sector. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Dr. Yeah. Can we have Dr. Kamfa? Kamfa, it's your turn. You can put your hand down, Dr. Ahmed. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Antelli, and uh, thank you all the discussants or the panelists for the presentation. But what I wanted, uh, oh, by the way, I'm a gyne oncologist practicing at Cancer Diseases Hospital. What I wanted to find out uh, from the panelists is uh, the use of HIFO in gyne, particularly endometrial or ovarian cancer. Has it been explored and to what extent for endometrial and ovarian cancer? Thank you. Uh, I, I can pick up on this question. Okay, the, those are the two uh, uh, indications you mentioned are not the indications for HIFU yet, okay? But just like the laparoscopic surgery, okay, how it became the state of arts, I think view uh, HIFU entering ob by starting uh, doing the benign uh, diseases, okay, is just the, uh, and the, as, the, and as the early stage, okay. So as more and more ob learn this technology, and I'm sure uh, the, uh, by integrating this technology with their interests, uh, clinical interests, we'll see the growing list of indications, okay. And uh, there's one thing, uh, one indication, cervical cancer, I think it's also on your mind, okay? And uh, which we did not include in today's discussion because that involves another small modality, okay? Portable small modality. Actually, we, Dr. Muzaza knows, uh, and visit, uh, upon visited us and uh, saw how it's operated there. Okay? And we, so this is actually, uh, there's another cancer indication can be done, which is the cervical cancer, okay? So this small modality, also the principle is the same, is the focus of the ultrasound and uh, can treat from chronic cervicitis, which will reduce the uh, risk of H, uh, HPV infection. It also can treat persistent HPV infection and also a stage, uh, 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 the stage one, uh, not a stage one, the pre-cancer uh, lesion, okay? So uh, in some of the Chinese centers has already brought to treat the stage one cancer. So I already had a, uh, extensive discussion with uh, Dr. Muzaza, okay? And due to the time reframe, so we did not include this uh, uh, small modality and the discussion around the cervical cancer using HIFU in today's panel. But I'm sure this will be a tremendous interest to Zago, okay? And if there's such a need, uh, we, we can organize another webinar, okay? But there's a different uh, a small modality and it's a portable. I think it's very important, important it's a portable, okay? So, um, uh, so I just want to make this uh, additional comment. Thank you very much, Professor, for highlighting that. I think you, you can take note, Zago, uh, there are a number of issues that are being addressed by this company one, of them is the cervicitis the professors mentioned, as well as the vulva lesions. I think that will be a discussion of another day. And also propose, in fact, there was the professor with the Zago. 
Zago, you could take it up, you could make arrangements and still have the same way for that. I'd seen Dr. Ajay's hand was up. Yes. You wanted to make a comment, Dr. Ajay? Uh, yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zaza. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here on this panel with our friends who have shared their experience and then to be with their friends from Zambia as well. Um, I think um, just to join uh, Professor Mohamed that, uh, uh, and what uh, Raymond has said, this technology actually, I think if anywhere, it actually tailor made for Africa. Um, because um, look at this typical surgical word um, or an uh, operation theater. How many people are involved? Okay. Especially in this part of the world where we know that doctors are in short supply. With HIFU, you can have a, a doctor, a nurse, and some, because it's like sedation, you don't need, even need a, a, an anesthetist, a nurse could do that. And so this, this thing really, and this technology, and then you don't need blood transfusion. You don't. So there's so many advantages, but I'll look at my our own experience. We just started, we treated our first patient June 25th this year. And so far we've treated about 42 patients now. And uh, the experience from this, okay, maybe because we are always known as a fertility clinic, because we've had a fertility center for over 18 years now. I can tell you that the greatest number of people that we're seeing have, have infertility as well. And um, just like everybody has said, it's uterine sparing, so they're likely to get pregnant uh, faster than well, if you do your myomectomy. They're likely to have uh, vaginal delivery after the, when they even get pregnant. These are things that I think they're very important to us. But one other thing that we have seen, which I don't think um, Raymond, because I've listened to Raymond a few times, is the incidence of adenomyosis in this environment. We have seen quite about, maybe about 20% of our patients that we've seen so far also have adenomyosis, you know, and that's, we see that this uh, technology is very good for management of adenomyosis as well. Though there's some, we need to manage the expectation of the patient. And like uh, from the experience from uh, Raymond also, we saw, we've seen more hypo-intense lesions, which is good for IV. So I think by and large, uh, this technology is just a wonderful technology for us. Um, because also the patients can go back to work earlier. And the fact that we are going to also look a lot about their fertility vis-a-vis um, -vis when we do IVF for them after this, what are the results going to be like? So we're actually uh, waiting with very, um, holding our breath to see the outcome where the first patient is just doing three months now. So we're just going to be three months next week. So we, we're going to do the three months assessment, but what we saw from the first one month shrinkage is just so similar to what uh, uh, Raymond also presented. So we, this is something that I wish that we could see how we can spread this technology more in Africa. So that, that's just my take. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Muzaza. Uh, do we have... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, can I make a comment regarding, uh, after Dr. Ajayi's uh, 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 share, sharing that uh, about uh, the training, about the training program, okay. Um, uh, so I, uh, Raymond, when you were trained uh, uh, with our doctors, I think, and also Hamid, okay, I think the, uh, the two of you has all have undergone a quite a lengthy time to learn this technology. I'm, I'm very happy to share with you that now uh, in my talk, I said, oh, now we have an international training program ready, okay? And the second is that um, the two centers, Dr. Ajayi Center started the operation in mid of May, okay? And within three months, one of his uh, doctor he assigned to learn this technology is being trained, means 
almost independent to do it. Okay, and uh, and uh, in uh, parallel, the Malaysian Center we opened the Malaysian Center, the first Malaysian Center in July. Dr. Silva Superman, okay, which is a leading KOL uh, in the APG, okay, and uh, who also cross the uh, uh, the who also is a, has a tremendous interest on fertility, okay. He learned in two months, so he passed the all test, okay. So I'm I'm here to say that, okay, uh, as the uh, doctors I uh, learn about this technology, interested to learn. Now we have a uh, we more optimized the training program ready, okay. And the second thing is that for Africa, okay, because for the MOH uh, of Zambia uh, in that letter to Haifu, they mentioned that a training program has to be uh, part of setting up the service and with the professional organizations, okay. And we also had the uh, intense discussion with uh, Dr. Muzaza how to integrate it into this into the training, uh, doctor's training, okay. And I think if we have more countries join this initiative, uh, we probably will uh, uh, set up a, a HIFU Academy for Africa so that uh, uh, relying on the, our existing centers and also by working with the professional societies from each respective country, we can tailor this uh, the training even better to the needs of the uh, African doctors. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Zambia, we are waiting for consents questions from you. Just note that Haifu is still holding one position for you for training. It's on that there is COVID, that's why no one can come. I can't see any hand. Antonio, is there a hand that I'm missing? Um, we are having a time overrun and seeing that there are no hands, I will ask the Secretary General for Zago to make her final comment, a wrap up comment. I think this has been two hours from the time we started. We had promised that it would be two hours. We had a few minutes. But I think we have managed to catch up unless there's something very heated. Dr. Schumer. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Mzaza. And again to the presenters, this has been a very, very enlightening moment for us. And the presentations are, are very helpful uh, in terms of uh, how we can uh, move forward. Um, we would like to just take the opportunity um, to say thank you for the privilege that uh, you could think of us as Zambia. Uh, we do look forward to collaborating with the organizers and uh, to see how the different uh, pieces can come together and bring us to a point where we have the high machine and the trainings, uh, a, we, we, we begin to select a, a, whoever needs to be trained and also um, uh, a point where we launch this major activity so going forward, uh, I would uh, uh, just encourage, I think, to, for us to continue communicating. Uh, we know we have the channel through you, uh, Dr. Mzaza, but uh, as one of the presenters has said, it will be good to begin to connect with them so that we begin to uh, collaborate at that level so that we understand a bit more of what is happening in the three, particularly the three African countries that have already uh, started the program. 
Yeah, so with that, thank you very much. And uh, we want to thank the other members that uh, managed to join or the, the Zambian team that has managed to join. And we do look forward also to the CME uh, on valve lesions and cervicitis and cervical cancer. We think that that will be very interesting and we are hopeful that uh, at that time, uh, as we share this particular link for this presentation, that people would have gone through it and they will take more interest in joining the other CME. So we may have started slow, but we will soon begin to run. So thank you very much, Dr. Mzaza. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Dr. Mzaza, uh, can I, uh, before the, uh, we conclude this, can I make a, a, a suggestion that uh, for everyone who attended this webinar, let's take a group photo online since we cannot take a photo offline. So may I ask everyone to open your uh, video, okay, so that we can have a, a picture, okay, we can have a picture, group picture taken, okay, so so all of us can cher cherish this moment when one day the service set up in Zambia, we know it started from here. Thank you. So, Thank you. Uh, uh, so Chusi, when you uh, see everyone uh, opened their video and let us know, and so we're all going to look at the, the, uh, the screen and you can take the picture. Yes, yes, Professor. Um, okay, uh, may I? Okay. Ask everyone okay, to. So, yeah. Yeah. Just uh, maybe I will count down three, two, one. Let me count three, two, one. I will take the photo. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. And I've taken, I've took. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. it's finished. Is it done? Okay, so we'll share yeah, with Dr. Muzaza and uh, Dr. Muzaza will share with the Zago members. Okay, and uh, thank you, thank you very much for uh, uh, taking your uh, weekend time. And uh, thank you, Raymond, David, and uh, Dr. Hamid, and uh, Dr. Ajayi. And uh, um, we hope to move this forward with Zago and uh, um, and looking forward to set up this service in the near future in Zambia. Okay, uh, turn, turn the microphone to you, uh, Dr. Mzaga. Thank you very much. I think you have wrapped up very well. Thanks to all the panelists, the presenters, and the members of Zago who have attended. We will continue working in the background with HIFU, Zago, and the Minister of Health. In fact, we are scheduling a meeting next week with the team from Haifu. They will come to Beijing. It's getting cold here. It's actually eight degrees now. But uh, Chongqing is actually quite warm. They can come and enjoy some good weather in Beijing. Thank you very much. And this brings us to the end of this webinar.